particular state. Thank you all for joining KSU's Franchise Management Speaker Series, Management 4124 Guest Speaker Series includes CEOs, private equity firms, leaders, bankers, entrepreneurs, and advisors. We are in a classroom on the KSU campus where due to student privacy requirements, the cameras only face front and in the top of the ceiling. So it may seem, I'm looking, may seem like I'm looking down and all by myself. Um, my name is Jordan Crowley, Professor of Franchise Management here at KSU. Uh, my non-professor life is as an independent equity sponsor acquiring businesses as a consultant and senior leader with companies such as McDonald's, Arby's, Home Depot, and more. Today, we are extremely excited to have Barry Falcon with us. Barry has seen franchising from honestly every angle. He's a franchisee, franchisor, CEO, and is a trusted advisor with the iFranchise Group. iFranchise is one of the strongest names in helping companies franchise or helping an existing franchise reach its next level of success. Barry's background includes, as I said, CEO, a new CEO of Concrete Craft, which is a concrete resurfacing franchise, co-founder, president, and chairman of Shelf Genie, a cabinet franchisee, and a franchise, and a franchise owner with Velocity Sports. All of the organizations he has led to successful exits and sales, and it's just amazing. Rarely can we have time with someone who's played on all sides of the franchise relationship, and so thank you, Barry. Thank you for joining us. We really appreciate it. Happy to be here. Absolutely. So what I, oh, we want to start, you had a, you had some slides that we want to start with that. Um, you tell um, me. Well, let's, so I guess I'd like to just a little, um, I'll give you a little uh, a two second blurb on myself in addition, but tell me, um, tell me about the students in the audience. That's who, or oh, whoever's in the audience, are they all students? Are they juniors? Yes, we, they we have juniors? students here in KSU, just the, the students in my class. They okay. love that uh, on this beautiful night, they get to spend two hours and 45 minutes here in a classroom. Gotcha. So, so the goal is to learn about franchising. So let me, give you, uh, let me give you a little story about myself and how I got into franchising and why, it's, and, why and how it's created generation wealth for my family. Wonderful. Okay, so uh, welcome all the students. Happy uh, to be here of your learning. I'm, uh, on the presentation, you'll have my contact information. So if you have any questions, more than happy to uh, answer them if you reach out. So uh, back in 2003, a little history lesson, 2003, I was looking to buy a business. And um, a friend of mine told me about this company, this franchise called Velocity Sports Performance. And my daughter was at then a high school uh, tennis player, um, middle school, high school tennis player in East Cobb, uh, Marietta. And I figured I'd buy this sports training franchise to help her train. She, um, she went to Walton High School, um, played for Walton for four years undefeated, went on, wow. to, went on to a D1 tennis scholarship at UNC. Um, ended her career very well, um, broke the freshman record. Um, so I bought a, a sports training franchise to help her train. And um, I got to travel around the country with her. So in, in, that, in that regards, I want to just talk to you about three requirements that I had when I bought a franchise. And I want you guys, everybody in the audience, should understand what their requirements are and what their lifestyle is when you buy a business to find out if you're buying a business or if you're buying a job. So my three requirements was the business had to make money and operate while I wasn't there. I wanted to travel around the country with my daughter watching her play uh, USTA tennis tournaments. So that was number one. Number two was it, it had to have no cash. Right, I did not want cash coming into the business on a regular basis, because in my experience, cash makes honest people dishonest. Right, and so um, it's easy for somebody working there to put a five or a ten or a twenty in their pocket. And this was before Apple Pay or Google Pay, so um, I just wanted checks and credit cards, no cash. Right, I didn't need to hide anything from the government. So that was one, that was my second requirement. And my third requirement was no teenage help. And, and that requirement was because I had three teenagers of my, cell, of my own, and I knew that on Friday night, if they had a hot date, they would just call in sick 
and uh, I'd be left holding the bag. So I didn't want teenage help. Those were my three requirements when I bought my Velocity Sports Performance. So I didn't want a seven day a week job like a restaurant where I'm there every day from morning to night. I needed to have the business run and make money while I wasn't there. And I didn't want any teenagers because while teenagers are great, um, they weren't so reliable that I could see. So when I bought a franchise, that was, that was part of my due diligence. So I would tell anybody that, that they're buying a franchise to make sure you have what your requirements are and what your lifestyle is because you're buying it to make money. Nobody's buying a franchise as a nonprofit. Okay. So, um, so that's, that's a little about franchising. So I built, I, I bought that franchise. I built it up over a couple of years. And then I realized the money to be made is being in the franchisor unless you're going to be a multi, very multi-unit franchisee. Because I could make a good living being a franchisee of a single location, but I couldn't get really wealthy. And I wanted to get really wealthy. And so unless I owned multiple units, um, I couldn't do that. So I said, I'm going to be the franchisor. And so uh, I sold my Velocity Sports Performance. And with another couple of friends, we founded a company called Shelf Genie. And we turned that into a franchise and that made, made custom glide out shelving for kitchens, baths, and pantries. And when you get nothing to do, you could look up uh, the website shelfgenie.com and you could buy your parents a present because we uh, do custom things for homes. Um, I guess, um, Jordan, if you could start the slide deck and then I'll tell you when to advance the slides. Okay. So, you know, I don't need the, uh, opening page, but if you can go to the, the second slide, that would be great. The opening page just has my contact information. If anybody wants to contact me, I'm not sure if, if you're getting this presentation. So so here, I'm going to talk about the end in mind, right? I told you I want you to- You can see this, right, Barry? I can see it just fine. Okay, great. So that's me with my Woodstock t-shirt on. And I went to Woodstock because I was a hippie in the 60s. And, um, and I'm drinking a bottle of champagne on the patio of my back porch. And so this is the end in mind. And that bottle of champagne is on the day I closed on selling Shelf Genie with 160 locations for many millions of dollars. So um, that day was historic, September 30th, 2020. I will never forget that day. That day is when the wire transfer hit my bank account on the sale of the company. Um, so that I met my goal. And so we had a goal of, to sell the company in eight or nine years. It took us 10 or 11, but the goal was worthwhile. So with the end in, the end in mind, I'm starting at the end because this is what I thrived for. So then I could live happily ever after which is what I'm doing now. Basically, um, a stress-free life. I work because I like to work. Um, I ride my bike four to 5,000 miles a year around the country for charity. Um, I run marathons for charity. Um, I'm 70 years old, and I just completed a marathon on Saturday, 26.2 miles with a 15-pound backpack on my back. Um, called a Tough Ruck Marathon to honor the fallen heroes. And um, so again, I work, I ride my bike, I run marathons, and I play pickleball. And I spend time with my family, my wife of uh, 47 years, and, uh, and my wow. three kids. So um, I, don't worry about I don't worry about financial things anymore. So um, again, with the end in mind, I wanted to kind of show you that slide. You could advance to the next slide. So that was me uh, really enjoying uh, the, uh, the moment. So um, next slide, please. So just a kind of high level of what franchise companies are all about. No, nope, back one. Yeah. Um, fr the franchise sales cycle, just so you're aware if you're learning about franchising, there's pre-sales and then there's post-sales. And so it's all about the concept and value proposition. Why should somebody buy my business? Um, what's the structure of the offer? Those are legal documents called franchise disclosure document, franchise agreement. What's the marketing plan to get franchisees? What's the message or the compelling call to action? 
to get somebody to buy a franchise. And that's whether it's McDonald's, Burger King, Orange Theory, Holiday Inn, or uh, the Atlanta Falcons. Um, Atlanta Falcons, by the way, um, I licensed my name to them, if you didn't know that. So um, they can continually um, you know, play mediocre football, but they use my name. That, uh, that, was, just, that was just like a joke. Um, advertising expenditures, and then the sales process of how you award franchises <laughs> to people that want to buy a business. And then now on the post-sale or implementation is, you know, selecting the right franchisee, um, training the franchisee, um, helping them get open because signing the franchise agreement and getting them open are two different things. If it's a brick and mortar, they need to, um, they need to find a location, negotiate a lease, do all that build out stuff. So you want to provide opening assistance and training, um, support, um, ongoing communications to help the franchisees be successful and then validation. And validation is when new prospective franchisees call existing franchisees to ask them three questions. How's the home office treating you? If you had the opportunity to buy this franchise again, would you buy it? And three is, are you making money? If the franchisee answers yes to all those three questions, the prospect normally uh, continues in the sales cycle. If something's not going well in the system, the franchise prospect might say, okay, on to the next franchise. This one's not a good one. So I wanted to give you a high level overview of the franchise sales process. Okay. Um, on to the next slide. So the next slide is, you know, do you need to be the first mover or do you want to make it uh, successful and, and spend time and time and time. So three companies listed here of which you all probably heard of and maybe um, you know, eaten at at one point. Uh, Crystal, founded in 1932, began franchising in 1990. Burger King, uh, founded in 1953, franchised in 1961. And the Golden Arches McDonald's, kind of like the, uh, the pillar of franchising, wasn't founded till 1955 um, but franchised right away. And if you haven't watched Ray Kroc's story of the founder, I strongly suggest that you go on YouTube and watch that video. And that's how McDonald's came to doubt. But look how many locations they have. And this was a couple of years ago. So they were the first one to franchise, maybe not perfect, but they franchised, um, let's say, you know, six years ahead of Burger King and they have almost three times the amount of locations. So you don't have to get it, you don't have to get it to be perfect, but being first to market surely helps. There's plenty of room for number two, three, and four, but it's great to be the leader, right? Because then everybody, and everybody will follow you. Whether it's pizza, you could name the top four pizza places, and then I could name 22 or 30 other pizza franchises, but the top three or four dominate the market in units and in sales volume, right? So it's not always, um, it's getting a new concept, bringing it to market and filling a void. And whether that's in food, whether that's in senior home care, whether that's in uh, exercise, whether it's in uh, some kind of home service brand like I did. Um, we, at Shelf Genie, we were the first to market to be a franchise and um, on a national basis. And that's why we grew very quickly, even during the recession of 2008, 2009. Okay. So give you a little background. So if you have a concept and an idea, get to market first and then perfect it as you go along. Next slide, please. So as I told you at the beginning, the goal was to sell, to make a lot of money. So I'm, I put a little, um, a little thing together, which is what we backed into at some point to say, this is what we want to do. And this is just an example so you can understand the mathematics. Um, so let's say we wanted to sell the company in for $10 million, right? Um, and I'm, again, this is an example. Uh, average selling price, maybe six or seven times earnings. 
In today's market, the way interest rates are low and private equity is high, um, you could sell companies for 10 to 15 to 20 times earnings, okay? Um, EBITDA, EBIT is earnings before income and taxes, before uh, interest and taxes. So we said, okay, well, what's our five-year earning plan if we, if we need to sell this for $10 million? How do we get to $10 million? Five-year earnings, we, gave our, we got our $10 million we divide it by 6.7 6 because that's the multiple we're going to use. So we need about $1.3 million in earnings to sell for 6.7 to get our 10 million. Okay. Average royalty in this example, franchisees are going to pay you $30,000 a year in royalties. $10,000 of that royalties is going to be profit. The other 20,000 is going to be overhead and support. Okay, so there we need a $10,000 per franchisee. We need to get 1.3 million in earnings at $10,000 a franchisee. We need 130 franchises. So if I could get 130 franchises um, up and running, then I could sell my business for 10 million. In our case, we sold with 160 locations, um, sold for a, over, a little over 10 times earnings, and a lot more than um, $10 million, right? North of, uh, north of $30, $40 million. So, um, but if you have a model and you have a goal, then it's very, very easy to back into the goal and figure out if your plan is realistic. So if somebody, and we, I have clients right now that say, I wanna sell for 100 million in seven years. And we build a, mo a financial model out to get to 100 million in seven years. So we said, okay, we need $10 million of earnings and we're going to sell for 10 times earnings. So how do we get 10 million in earnings so we could sell for 100 million? And then they realize how many franchises they need in this year in their budget. And they realize it might be a little unrealistic. So not to have unrealistic goals, those are okay to shoot for, but in reality, is it going to happen or are you going to miss every milestone? So any business you're in um, with franchising, franchise scales, which means you could make money while you're not there if you're the franchisor and if you're a franchisee and if it's the right business. And depending on what kind of um, business you like, whether it's food service or home service or aftercare or childhood development, you have to find something you like to do. What I mean by that is people say, if you find something you like to do and, and that's your job, you'll never work a day in your life. I don't necessarily believe that. I believe if you like something to do, most often you'll be happy, but I'm not sure you'll never work a day in your life because as you grow an organization, there's people issues, there's economy issues, there's supply chain challenges, there's customer issues. So it's never perfect sailing all the way, but it's nice to be the captain of the boat if you want to be the captain. And franchising lets you get there and then grow a business and then ultimately exit that business. So um, when I was selling uh, franchises for Shelf Genie, when we were selling franchises, people came to us with their requirements. This was a home-based business. They didn't have to sign a lease. They didn't have to spend 300 to a million dollars to get into the business. They could get all in for about $100,000. So um, much more attractive audience than to buy a restaurant and you need a million dollars to get into it. But each individual needs to find out what's their lifestyle. Do you want to work six days a week, five days a week, three days a week? What's your goal? How much money do you want to make? And then what are the, vi the viable choices to get to that goal? And there's 4,000 franchises in the U.S. currently and about 300 new ones coming on board every year. The top 12% have 100 locations or more. That's all. So um, not many people get to 100. It's a big magic number. Most of the people could name 20 or 30 of the big ones, but they don't know. They couldn't name 100. The big people, everybody knows. It's the little guys that have 40 and 50 and 60. No one's ever heard of, whether it's a candle company, a wax company, a cleaning company, a window cleaning company, you know, a plumbing company. They have 40, 50 
um, franchises. They're doing, you know, pretty good revenue, but you haven't heard of them because they're not nationwide in marketing all over. So all I would tell my uh, young students um, is to have a goal. So I mentioned I have um, a couple of kids. So I have three kids. One is a pilot for United Airlines. He flies 737s. He started flying when he was 12 years old, 13 years old. Um, Mar he flew out of McCollum Airport in Kennesaw, just right where the school is. Got his private pilot's license before he got his driver's license. And so he had a goal. He wanted to be a pilot. So he took uh, flying lessons at a very young age. He's 39 years old right now. Wanted no part of my business. My middle son is um, 32 years old, and he's in the private equity space. He went to the Ohio State University, got a degree in finance, and got into the private equity space. He's now 32. He lives in Chicago, wanted no part of my business. My daughter is, um, went to a UNC on a full tennis scholarship, graduated. She's a registered dietitian at Northside Hospital, wanted no part of my business. What all the kids wanted was some of the proceeds of the sale of the business. And um, so they didn't want any part of the business as far as working in the business, but they sure liked the, uh, the proceeds. And I was happy to um, take them all out to dinner to a fancy restaurant and uh, put a check in an envelope and we had a nice celebration. So, um, and now um, I still take care I'm of I'm available to be adopted, Barry. <laughs> right. I have, uh, I have kids here who are more than willing to be, to be there too. Right. So, um, so my kids are really close and we have a great family and we vacation a lot together and um, two of them live in Atlanta, one in Chicago. So um, I get to see them a bunch and try not to have to uh, take care of them, but they're all pretty successful themselves. So I guess, um, I guess the next slide, I'll just kind of close on the presentation part with the next slide is have a goal. And, you know, the football teams have a goal to win the Super Bowl and the baseball teams. I went to the Braves game last week with my kids on ring night on Saturday night. And the goal of the Braves is to win the World Series again, right? And so everything they do in that organization is to win the World Series. And if they win the World Series, they know they're going to make a lot of money. They're the owners of the team, right? But they have a goal. And every place, and in the university at Kennesaw State, years ago was in like a no-name university and now it's a major university and my friend harry gaslow his son was on right was on um jeopardy and college jeopardy and he got a big name helped the kennesaw state university but um you know now um the the university has a goal to to do great in the community and graduate great students and and have them uh, make money and give back to the university so um, all I would say is in your young years, have a goal, figure out what works. And I don't deny anybody that trades hours for dollars. And if you do that, that's okay. But understand your hourly rate has to be really high if you're going to generate generational wealth. And so a doctor that makes $500 an hour which is an, a lot of money. And so that's $4,000 a day times five, it's $20,000 a week times 50, um, right? 20,000 times 50, a million bucks a year. Okay, so a million dollars a year is a lot of money, a really lot of money, um, but it's not $10 million, right? And so if you're gonna be an executive at a company, you'll make a lot of money. If you're gonna have a job making $100,000, which is a lot of money also, um, it just doesn't scale. So my, my advice is look for things that you're gonna do as a career that you like to do, but also that scale, right? Because if they don't scale, um, a friend of mine's a chiropractor and he does okay, but unless he has three or four docs in the office, Every time he takes a vacation, he makes no money. Every time he calls in sick, he makes no money. Um, so uh, anytime he wants to take a, take a day off to golf, he, he makes no money. So um, while he loves doing what he's doing and he graduated from Life University, um, he makes a good living, but does not generate wealth, okay? So that's my, uh, that's my uh, line on, on goals. And, and I'm not saying it's, you don't have to have that as a goal. It was just my goal because I wanted to live happily ever after. Some people's goal is just to uh, enjoy themselves, give back, work for a job, retire when they're 65, and that's it. No problem. Whatever works for you, stay healthy, most important.
So um, I guess, um, can we, is there open it up for questions and answers? Sure, sure. I'll, I'll lead it off. Um, and I'm, I'm sure the kids will, will chime in. So how'd you get involved? First of all, it's an amazing story. Let's just start with that. And uh, congratulations, especially to sell it during the pandemic. Um, I'm sure that was a, a crazy time for you. Yep, the goal was to sell it before the election. That was the main thing, because I had no clue what was going to happen in the election and didn't know what was going to happen with the economy. So the goal was to sell it before the election. So we sold it on September 30th, before oh, the election. Perfect. So now tell me about how you got involved with iFranchise. So how I got with iFranchise is when I started my franchise company, um, Shelf Genie, in 2007, I needed a franchise consultant. So I interviewed three or four or five franchise consultants. iFranchise was one of them. And they were the most reputable and best people in franchising. So I wanted to align myself with the best and have the mentors that were the best. So I hired them in 2007, 2007 spent a lot of money, well over 100000 with them. And then we launched the franchise in 2008. When I sold, and we kept in touch all along. When I sold my last company in 2014, they asked me to come to work for them. They said, yeah, you've been a franchisee, you've been a franchisor, you know this stuff. Why don't you come work for them? I said, I love giving back. So um, sure, let's talk. And uh, I've been working with them for almost eight years now. Oh, so while you were doing the, the other franchise? Right, so while I was doing Shelf Genie, I was the chairman of the board, but I stepped away from the day-to-day -day operation. The CEO reported to me. Um, I had sold Concrete Craft in 2014. Um, and so then I was like, hey, what am I going to do next? I'm going to go run another franchise company. I was still the chairman of Shelf Genie. So I didn't have, I didn't work day to day, but um, I reaped the benefits and I sold concrete craft to a company called Home Franchise Concepts in California. So I was looking for the next uh, gig I was going to do. And the owner of iFranchise Group asked me to come work for them. And I've been there ever since. Jada? Um, hi, my name is Jada. Um, I was just asking because I, I see that like you keep like emphasizing um, giving back and like even with you doing like the marathons for charity and everything um, with your business, do you guys do any type of giving back? Uh, absolutely. Um, all my businesses, um, we've did a lot of, a lot of giving back either in the community or to national stuff. I give back, of course, myself. Um, by doing a lot of charitable things and our business donates to charity. And I think, I think every company should give back, whether it's to local or to national. Um, there's a lot of good charities out there in the world. You just have to, you have to give back to the one that's closest heart to you. But whatever it is, whether give back money or give back time, those are two valuable resources. Everybody should give back. Uh, hey, Barry, my name's Ethan. Uh, I got a quick question for you. Sure. I know not too long ago you were talking about, you know, finding something you love or like to do um, and making a career out of it. Well, for you, when you were starting Shelf Genie, you know, what made you go with shelves or, you know, something that's a um, sure for people to put in their homes? Like in that right. So, so, so I, I did not wake up one morning and say, boy, I'm really fascinated with moving shelves in a kitchen. Um, I had no, no aspirations of that at all, but I looked at the business model and said, oh, we could make money doing this. And so we bought a little company in Richmond, Richmond, Virginia. We bought a company that had a small little factory with the goal of turning it into a franchise. But I was not enamored by kitchen shelves and I was not enamored by concrete um, on that company either. I just looked at it to say, it's a solid business. I could make money. I can do this. It was, it was something I could wake up in the morning and be proud of versus, uh, and something that my kids would be okay going to school and said, oh, my dad owned Shelf Genie versus I own some uh, X-rated porn site and I was making a lot of money, but I, I wasn't an upholding citizen in the community. So um, I just learned to like it. Um, but it was really all business reasons. Okay, I guess another question I have off of that, um, because it was all kind of uh, intelligent business decisions that you made. I know earlier on, you, you gave a brief background on kind of uh, what your kids did and where they went to school. I can't remember whether or not you gave us your background. Where did you go to school and what did you study when you were there? 
Yeah, so I, I'm a, I'm a, I, I went to school, I went to Queens College in New York. Again, I'm a hippie in the 60s. And, um, and then I went to California on a vacation. I never went home. So um, I studied general business, got a regular degree in business, had no clue what I wanted to do, right? No passion, just went, left home, went to California, got a job in, in, a, in a manufacturing company that I spent 20 years in, right? So I worked there from age 21 to 41, 42. Um, and I worked my way up the corporate ladder to number two in command. And then um, when the company got sold, I took the early buyout and I left and I've done entrepreneurial things, entrepreneurial things after that and realized a job's great, but I'm making other people wealthy. I need to make myself wealthy. Got to go work for myself. Perfect. Thank you. And so you're, you're working for yourself. Um, share with us some of, the, some of the trials and tribulations of your time at Shelf GM I mean, share with us. You know, some of the things that worked out really well, some of the things where maybe things didn't look so good. Yeah, so at, so at the beginning, it's always the hardest, right? And so when you're initially getting started, you're working long days. Again, you're working for yourself and you're taking minuscule salaries, right? You're, you got to keep the budget going. You need staff. So um, you invested a certain amount of money. We invested all of our, the founders put in some money and then we got some, a few outside investors. Um, but it's long hours at the beginning and then surround yourself with the right people and then get involved in an industry called franchising. I went to every franchise conference I could go to to learn and find mentors and other people in the business. And so the successes are when you award a franchise, he gets up and running and he's successful. And that's the first one is the hardest to get. And the second hardest is the second hardest to get. And then it gets, it gets easier as time goes by as the business is scaling. But to give you a little example, we make product. The products we make is out of Baltic birch. And so Baltic birch comes from Russia, predominantly Russia or China. And so the Russia Baltic birch has a, a much higher quality. So if they have a very warm winter in Russia, the trucks can't get through the forest to harvest the birch. So the birch prices skyrocket, right? So again, then you learn about supply chain, supply and demand, and then you have some challenges because the customer, the retail customer is only going to pay a certain amount. And if your raw material goes up 50%, it's hard to increase the price to the customer where they'll buy it. So there's always challenges and sleepless times. And every customer, while you love them, sometimes it's a challenge. And every staff member or employee, you love them, but every employee is a headache, right? And I, don't, I say that in reality because people issues are the toughest. This is pre-pandemic. So everybody came to work every day from certain now 8.30 to 5.30. No one was allowed to work from home. That was like forbidden. And, um, and that was a whole different era than it is now, right? With, with technology and trust. And, and so there's always challenges with, Supply chain, customers, competition, and employees. It's never perfect, right? Even Elon Musk has challenges, and so does Jeff Bezos. They're different challenges, but they have challenges. And so you're at the company, and were you, did you start as the chairman? Did you grow into that role? Did you, were you also the CEO? Did you, did you I, I, start, I started as the president of the company. I was one of the four of us founded the company. I was the president. Um, and one of the partners was uh, the CEO and the chairman. And then, um, then we had an organizational change for some reasons. And um, we uh, hired in a new CEO and I became the chairman. And so walk us through, you know, this is something that the, the kids is in kind of a new discussion, but walk us through your exit process. Sure. When you decided to exit, you know, to put the company up for sale, how that process went, what you guys decide to do, again, what worked, what maybe didn't work. Sure. Yeah, so from experience, I sold my concrete company first before I sold Chelsea Genius. That was a smaller transaction, but I did that myself. I hired a franchise attorney. I went to the market. I knew a couple of companies that might uh, want to buy us, negotiated a deal, and um, and we got a, we got a, we sold 70% and then 30% that five years later, but negotiated a deal. And I kind of orchestrated the whole thing. 
The two founders, I was not the founder, I was the CEO and partner. The two founders stayed on for five years. They're currently employees of the company. I transitioned out as the CEO, um, left the company after three months, took my money and said, thank you very much. Shelf Genie, I was the chairman and uh, we, we, the board of directors um, decided that we want to exit. No, none, of the, uh, none of the shareholders were working in the company. The CEO reported to me. And so I hired an investment banker. That was the way to do it. No different than hiring a real estate agent to help sell your house. I hired an investment banker. They helped us get our act together, get financial plans together, put a book together or, or you know, what called a confidential information memorandum, a SIM. And then they put it out to market um, and they put it out to auction basically. And they put it out to all the franchise companies that would be a potential buyer of Shelf Genie. And then they kind of narrowed down the scope of people that were interested based on the terms of the deal um, and the price, right? Terms and price. So it's not only price, it's terms because somebody might give you a lot of money, but they want a 10 year earn out. We didn't want a 10 year earn out, right? Um, and we wanted to sell and be gone. So, um, so that's how, and so the trans it's, it's lab laborious because they're um, you're not telling anybody. So you're doing this in stealth mode franchisees didn't know about it. Only a, a couple of staff members knew that we were going to sell the company, the CEO and uh, paralegal, um, no one else knew. So we're doing everything in, you know, secret meetings at the airport and stuff like that. Um, and then ultimately you, uh, you have an attorney and you have accountants and they're scrubbing numbers and doing quality of earnings and franchise audits. And you narrow it down to a one bidder um, and then you get a letter of intent from them and they do their due diligence and hopefully you close the deal. And so we did an all cash offer. No, uh, no earn out, no anything, just all cash. And guys, an earn out is basically when I, it, it, it would say, hey, you know what, there's, there's a couple ways. Sometimes you have to reach some guy, some tent poles. I reach this tent pole, you get more Correct. money. It's Correct. Like, anywhere from one year to, to seven, 10 years, pretty long, but one to five years in terms of the process. So if you hit this number after a year, well, the original owners get this. And if you Correct. Hit that, it means it keeps going up. So there's some upside and they gave us the opportunity to reinvest in the company, um, which I did. And um, I reinvested with the company, figured, okay, they'll sell the company in five years. I'll get some more money back. Um, four months later, they sold the company and I got another payday. So it was, um, it, it was, yeah. So Neighborly sold the company. They were owned by Harvest Partners in New York. They sold it to K. They sold it to KKR um, four months after, four or five months after the transaction. So um, I got to pay the government a little more money in taxes. Nothing wrong with that if there's a check behind it. Right. So I tell everybody, you know, after you sell a company and you have capital gains, you write you write a big check to the government, but it's better to write a check and have gains than it is to have losses. That's 100 percent true. So you are. Um, oh, Avery? sorry. Hey, Mary. It's Avery. I have a quick question for you. Sure. I know you're part of the I franchise group and. There's only, currently about 4,000, but you mentioned there are about 300 new ones coming on every year. How do you personally advise them if it's a new industry you have no idea about? Or is it the same general no, advice? No. So three requirements for us to take you on as a client. Um, pretty basic requirements, but they're important. One is the business has to be duplicatable, whatever it is. So it has to be duplicatable. It can't just be something some one person could do. The other thing is it has to be so duplicatable. Um, it has to be um, scalable, right? You gotta, gotta be able to do that. You gotta be able to train people and do that. Uh, it has to be profitable. So you have to have a business model, a prototype that works, okay? It can't just be on the paper and napkin back in the internet days in 1999, somebody had an idea and, and they got $10 million in funding and off to the races they went. Um, for us to be on a client, it needs to be duplicatable. For, it needs to have a pro. It needs to have a prototype, and it needs to be a product or service that somebody wants on a regular basis. Okay, so those are the three requirements: a prototype that's working successful, and I'm going to give you a story in a second. A uh, prototype that's successful, a product or service that somebody wants, 
and it has to be duplicatable. So a side story to that, we had a client that says, I want to franchise my restaurant. And they have five locations, all losing money every single month. And so we said, okay, this is not going to work because the franchisee is going to go out of business very quickly. And so the, uh, the asterisk here is that it was a lady's hobby and her husband is a sports celebrity worth in excess of $100 million. So she's running around saying, oh, people are going to buy this franchise because they want to rub elbows with me and my husband. Um, we said, if you want to franchise this, we got to get your food costs under control and your labor costs under control, or it's not going to work as a franchise. So let us help you do that before you franchise. If you don't have a profitable model, it doesn't work. It will go out of business and it will all implode very quickly. So those three requirements have to be important for us to take you on as a client. And then what, um, in terms of, of I franchise, when you're looking at a good franchisee, what are you looking for in that regard in terms of you know, helping these companies get to the next level, helping the franchisors get to the next level of success. Sure. So, so every company needs to create a profile of what their ideal franchisee is. So, of course, financial qualifications is number one. That they got to have enough money to buy the business and enough working capital to get started. And then, what's their background? So, if somebody came to me and said, "I want to buy six locations." They never run a business before. They're an exec with a check, meaning they were an executive in a company. They got a severance package, and now they're going to go buy a business. But they've never run a company before. They were, you know, the head of purchasing or something. And they have no, they have no people skills to run a business, and so might not be the best franchisee if they've never done anything entrepreneurial. And depending on what your business is, and does it need to be a technical skill? People that buy restaurants and have no cooking experience, better hire a chef, right? Um, I bought a Velocity Sports Performance. I had no clue about it. I hired a general manager person that had a sports training business. Um, and um, and I, um, I hired that person and he was the general manager running the business. And then we hired trainers to do the work. I was the business guy doing lead generation and marketing and shaking hands in the neighborhood, right? Um, so a matter of fact, the, my, my general manager, I stole from the Woodward Academy, right? So he was the strength and conditioning coach from the Woodward Karen, uh, and I stole him away. And so, um, and so when you're buying a franchise and to get the right franchisee, they need to have the right personality. If in most franchises, you have a customer and in the business. So you have interpersonal skills and transactions. And if the person doesn't, if the franchisee doesn't like talking to people, um, it's gonna be a tough franchisee if you're in the sales and marketing business, right? You know, in-home sales is all about in-home sales and building a relationship with customers. My son worked at the Dunkin' Donuts through a high school, which is now just called Dunkin' Brands. Um, you know, you have to deal with customers and people are irate when the coffee's not right or the donut's not right. And you have to have the right skills or be trained on those skills to, um, to handle customers. So what's the best franchisee? Um, there's, there's testing to do that. There's a lot of companies that do profile testing and they can tell you if you have a, um, if you have a good franchisee, he takes the test. And then you create the profile of what's the like to copy him. So they have to have some analytical skills, some people skills. And if you're in a child development schedule uh, franchise, you don't want somebody that's been arrested for, you know, being a pedophile, right? So um, you have to understand who your franchise is and what their background is. And do you make mistakes and, and award to the wrong people? At times you do. And, and people make that mistake at the beginning when they're desperate to sell their first location or their second, sometimes they make a mistake and they sell it to the wrong person. And that person is usually married to you for 10 years at least. So not easy getting a divorce. Um, um, they just, hopefully it works out. So kind of a going circling back around, you should set up a profile of what's the skills required to be a successful franchisee and personality. Makes sense. Um, hey, Barry, it's Jada again. Um, mm -hmm. I, was just, I was just asking, um, I remember when you showed us the McDonald's stats, how like, uh -huh. 
how they started franchising the same year yep. um, and how successful they were like how would how um how would you recommend like a business interested in franchising their company like how soon and like um as, as soon as you have a model that works and so a real life story is massage envy if you heard of them we franchised them when they were in business for four months the franchise process took six months from start to finish so by the time we were done they were in business for 10 months and they had 10 months of month over month improvement of revenue and then we franchised it when they sold the first time I don't remember how many units, but it was in north of $200 million. So what I would say is I would get the franchise as fast as you can as soon as you got a, a, a working prototype that's making money. Okay. Perfect. Uh, let me see if there's any last questions. Any last questions? Hey, Barry, this is Chris. Thanks for speaking with us today. Sure. Uh, sure. Uh, you mentioned a few minutes ago about uh, marketing and getting leads for potential franchisees. Mm -hmm. um, what were some ways that y'all went about doing that? Like some channels that you would go through? To sure. sure. Um, a lot of channels. And just to give you, give you some guidance, um, industry standards, you're going to spend about eight to $10,000 in marketing for every franchise you award. That's one industry standard from last year. Another one is that you're going to, for every hundred people you talk to, you're gonna you're gonna award a franchise to maybe one to two percent, unless you're a, a really booming hot franchise. So now, how do you generate those hundred leads to get two franchisees? Of course, the internet, right? So you're gonna do you're gonna do pay per click. You got to do SEO. You're gonna be at um, certain um, internet portals. You're also gonna do trade shows. You might do direct mail in certain geographic areas, business opportunity seminars. Um, so trade shows for the consumer. Um, we're here in Atlanta. So there's franchise shows at the Cobb Galleria um, a couple of times a year. So there's franchisors there. And then the public comes there looking for services, but looking to buy a business. And so if you're a franchisor, you attend industry trade shows where they market those trade shows to consumers. There's also franchise brokers that people that um, there's there's a lot of franchise brokers in the country and they become your um, independent agent. And they get paid based on results. If you close a deal, they get a big commercial. So you use brokers. So marketing as many places as you as your budget can afford. Um, so if we have a client that says, I want to open up 20 locate or I want to award 20 franchises this year, we tell them. Be, pre be prepared to spend 200000 right? So you don't have to put the money up in front because every time you sell a franchise for twenty five dollars or forty dollars or 50000 you get some more cash and you reinvest that in the business. But eight to $10,000 in marketing costs per franchise. So um, however you're going to spend it, you have to have money to spend to fill the pipeline with leads so you can close some in month three or four and then try to close you know one or two every month and then you get to 10 at the end of the year. So in, in, the internet is absolutely, a, you know, a big source. Of this. Well, Barry, your story is absolutely inspirational. I mean, from, from, you know, starting corporate and being a franchisee and being a franchisor and now being able to share some of your knowledge and thinking with, with both clients and with the students here today, we can't thank you enough. Um, very, very impressive. And we look forward to uh, hearing more great things from my franchise, as I've shared with you privately. The books from your group are, are some of the, are the main books we use in the class. So it's been, Super. It's been great for us. And uh, we wish you well. And, and be well. thanks again for taking Well, thank, thanks for having me. I wish everybody continued success. If I can help in any way, just let me know. Uh, yeah. you, can, my, you can look at my LinkedIn profile, Facebook profile. You can find me pretty easy. Wonderful. Well, be well and congratulations. And may you have another bottle of champagne in your near future. You got it. Thanks, guys. Good luck to everybody. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.